Well, good morning and happy Thursday. So Megan and I did not coordinate this morning. We should have. I should have told her not to take a shower. That would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> but I am in Cancun. Uh, very excited about that. Miss Megan obviously showered. And so the two of us, I'm like, like whatever. I, it, it was such a struggle. Me. I didn't want to, but I was like, I have to wash my hair. I just have to. I can't, I can't not do it. And there's nothing more tacky than having a bed in your frame. I don't care. I hate it. And I hate that. I was like, how can I get bigger? The desk is attached to the wall. I had no choice on this one. So we're just super excited though. Even though I'm in Cancun, we had to do this because obviously you guys know there's a lot going on right now with bank failures and interest rate volatility. What are you talking to your clients about and I know Megan is going to fill us all in on what's happening in the market right now so that you can go into this weekend feeling confident that you're advising your clients to the best of your ability. Because I've heard from a lot of agents, and I'm sure, Megan, you are hearing the same thing. Like, they don't quite know how to price a listing. They don't know quite what the market is going to do. They don't know quite how to advise their buyers. Do they go in high? Do they give up the things? Like, where is this market headed? Overall, what do you think? the temperature of the market is right now? So it softened a little bit this last week. And okay. I was hoping to see more market activity because interest rates dropped by half a point. And I thought that that would spawn more showings, but we're also in spring break time right now. And so I don't know exactly when spring break falls for all of the different school districts, but last week, Douglas County was on spring break. And so there was about a 9% decline in the amount of pending transactions last week. So we had a little bit of a softer week last week. Uh, this week, uh, going into this week, it's Jefferson County next week. Uh, I think DPS is the week following that. So we've got three different districts that have the three major different districts that all have spring break going on during this three week period. So be conscientious of that when you're listing your properties. If you have to list over spring break, I'd list the weekend before the first weekend of spring break and not the second weekend. Um, but it's been interesting to see that fluctuation. I was really hoping for more market activity this last week. Which is interesting because these spring breaks are going to bounce right into Easter. So mm -hmm. we definitely have a lot of different factors that are coming into what is happening in the market. And then, of course, we had the Fed meeting this week. So I was kind of struggling with my quote. I really like my quote last week. Uh, this week, I'm just doubling down on getting shit done. <laughs> I was almost not going to say it. And then I was just like, I'm just saying because I'm not even dressed up. So I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> I even have my bathing suit on. I'm ready to get out here. <laughs> so far. Here's my quote. I find that the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. I have had a lot of conversations right now with agents, with even other lenders, with people in this industry going, there's so much volatility. There's so much news coming at us. But the majority of industries aren't feeling the turbulence that we are. So how are we doing our job? We almost have to mute the noise. We have to get super focused on being in relationship and being in communication with our clients and with our sphere. And then we have to double down because this is the period of time where we get to gain market share. This is the period of time where we get to expand those people that we get to serve so that we can continue to communicate and educate. So that's where I kind of, I landed on my quote. Um, I do really think that we're gonna continue to see change beyond the interest rates, beyond the lack of inventory, beyond the psyche of the buyer and seller, we're going to start seeing drips of AI and how that's going to change. I just had a, a fantastic conversation, or I don't know, fantastic, interesting conversation last night about AI and where we think it's going to change real estate. And if you can do a car loan in a matter of 20 minutes, why can't you do a home loan that fast? And the biggest issue is how deeds are recorded. And once that gets solved, our industry is going to keep changing. And so how are we staying on top of those changes and being in relationship with our clients? I don't know, such a cool time right now to be doing what we're doing. It is great. It is definitely great. Should we go ahead and get into the numbers? Let's get this show on the road. Let's do it. All right. So I actually have two different reports that I'm going to share with you today because the market seems fickle is the best way that I can describe it right now. 
where some spots are hot and some spots are not. And so I wanna make sure that I go over with you after we run through the weekly numbers, I wanna share with you the heat map of the absorption rate based off of zip code so that you can see where some of these hot areas are and where things start to cool down again. And so it's really been interesting to watch the overall market because I'm getting a lot of questions on Mondays about, gosh, I put up a listing this weekend and I only got two showings. Can you help me out and understand what's happening in this market? And always feel free to reach out to me. If you want me to pull based on your zip code and your price range, how many shows per property per week were happening in the last week, you can always reach out to me for that type of information, shows to contract, and uh, median days on market for pending transactions based off of how long your listing has been in the market, because it is varying by different zip codes and different subdivisions. And so it, it makes a big difference if you go from Lodo to Low High to Highlands to Baker, it just depends on where you are in the marketplace right now. And so I can help you decipher what some of these trends are going to be. Now this covers the week of March 15th through the 21st. So this is just our last week. I was up at my happy 4 a.m. yesterday morning, pulling all of the data out for you. And again, here Here's your heat map. We're dealing with a lot of people right now that want to list in May, and I'm trying to encourage people to get to market sooner this year. I think that our compression cycle may be shorter this year than what we've seen in years past. Historically, the compression cycle has lasted from February to May, where we have more buyers in the market than homes to sell them. But based on data from the last week, we started to see inventory creep up a little bit more. So the longer that we remain in this similar cycle, we had a similar cycle from 2013 through 2019. We have data that point sellers towards listing in March and April, we're starting to see more listings come to market in March and April than we have historically before, because sellers are hip to the fact that buyers are starting to hunt for homes sooner in the year. And so I think that May is a really distracting time of the year to try and have a listing go up. We've got Cinco de Mayo that falls on a Friday. The following weekend is Mother's Day weekend. We see about a 10 to a 15% decline in the market over Mother's Day weekend. Then you've got all of the graduations and then you end up having uh, Memorial Day at the end of the summer, at the end of the month. And a lot of people end up stopping their search during Memorial Day weekend. Three day weekends, we end up seeing about a 30 to a 40% decline in showing activity and pending transaction count. So again, I'm not a big fan of May listings. I'm really pushing people into March and April. And this is a great visual for you to try and push people earlier into April uh, rather than later in to April. Uh, I started let tracking. Me, hey, Megan, let me jump yeah. in there just for a second, though, because it's going to be super interesting. I know that that's our seasonal trend line, but if we actually, and we'll talk on the back half about interest rates, but if we actually see interest rates drop and we get a pickup in the second half, I mean, we have to kind of recognize when we veer off of the trend lines and get some opportunity and kind of stay alert to those opportunities the second half of the year. Of course. And that's why I track this stuff on a weekly basis is so that we know these up-to-date changes. But there's no guarantees that rates are going to drop going into the second half of the year, especially since inflation isn't necessarily under control quite yet. And so I don't know that I want to bank on having lower interest rates in the second half of the year. Uh, and so again, I think the opportunity is now and we're starting to see more new listing inventory make its way to market now. So I would hate for you to miss out on those great listings that are coming to market now rather than waiting until the second half of the year. But of course, we'll track and we'll trend that out to see if there's something that's abnormal or if we have an extended selling season. But I really do think that our compression cycle is going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, as you can see here from our strategy sheet built out by week, uh, we are nicely warming up as we get into the spring market uh, here in Metro Denver as I track the inflow and the outflow of business, showing activity shows per listing and price decreases. Based on data from this last week, you can see that our average daily active count went up by 0.7% and new listing activity was down by about 8.8%. 8 .8%. And so a lot of people chose not to list over spring break week down in Douglas County. And so we ended up seeing a slowing of new listing activity going into market. Now, usually what happens is some people take that week of spring break to spoof up their house while they've got the kids home and they get their house ready for sale for the week following spring break. So we say we may see a pickup of new listing activity in Douglas County in this following week. Uh, again, looking at where we are, Jefferson County spring break is this week, uh, and then going into Denver County schools, that's next week. So again, we're going to see some shifting and maybe some less listing inventory coming on as we get into these spring break weeks. Our pending transaction count, which kind of surprised me in light of interest rates being down this last weekend, uh, our pending transaction count fell by about 7% this last week, where we put about 1,000 units under contract. 
Interestingly enough, back on markets also went way down. And so these transactions last week were really sticking and our fallout rate was only about seven or 8% of our transactions falling out of contract. Overall, however, we remained at 0.8 months worth of inventory signaling that multiple offers are likely, depending on which area you're in and if your home is definitely show ready to go. Buyers don't want projects this year. They want turnkey ready to go homes because they're buying at the top of their debt to income ratios. They don't have a lot of money left over to go in and do major renovations on a home right now. Uh, looking at the odds of selling, it actually came down by 0.6%, but it's still hanging in there higher than our average baseline for 2013 through 2019 at 64.4% based on data from this last week. Again, the odds of selling is where I take into account all of the available listings for sale versus those that go under contract and or close in the same week. And I project it forward for about a 30 day period of time. Uh, I'm expecting that the odds of selling is going to remain relatively consistent for the next two weeks as we go through some of the spring breaks. We should see a little pop of activity the first weekend in April that is not Easter weekend. Easter weekend is the second weekend in April, and so I expect the market to be down and the odds of selling to decline by a couple of percentage points over Easter weekend. During Easter weekend, we end up seeing the market and pending transaction counts and showing activity end up, ends up declining by about 20% over that weekend. So don't list over Easter weekend. But conversely, if you have a buyer, it's a great weekend to have your buyer out there and looking for homes as you go through Easter weekend. In this market, based off of units that went under contract last week, we would need to have about 26,500 total listings available for sale in order to offset demand. Again, we only have 3,700 that are available right now, making our 14% of market balance. So we're far out of a market correction. We're not looking for any major shifts or changes. Average prices are actually going up right now. And as I go through and I interview my agents that send me transactions on Mondays and Tuesdays, as I thank them for their orders, I'm still hearing consistently about 35 to 40 percent of them are in multiple offer situations and so it seems like it's no man's land you're either under contract with multiple offers the first weekend or you're hanging out for a couple of weekends and it's important that you guys are paying attention to these data points because pricing is really challenging right now and what i'm hearing uh, i had the opportunity to listen to a larry kendall presentation a couple weeks ago and what he said is you can't really rely on comps right now but you're pricing in line with your competition in the neighborhood and what's going under contract. And so I think that that's probably your best strategy is to look at those active listings, call those listing agents that have listings that are under contract in your neighborhood to see how their transactions went. If they were in multiple offers, if they went for full price or if they went for over, if they're offering concessions, try and get some of that information out of those listing agents that are under contract right now. So you have a better sense of where to list your properties in the marketplace at this point. Uh, showings this last week, we had about 13,783 total showings that were set this last week. Week over week, that fell by about 9.3%. And so again, I think that's spring break taking effect right now. I was hoping that that number would go up uh, as we saw that interest rates drop, but that meant that we were getting about 3.7 shows per property per week. So again, since pricing is so tricky right now, it's important that you're paying attention to your showing activity, your shows to contract, and your median days on market for your zip code and your price range so that you know how long you should be on the market. And again, I can help you with all of those numbers if you shoot me an email. My email address is maller, M-A-L-L-E-R at first, F-I-R-S-T-A-M.com. Shoot me an email and I'm able to help you out with that if you need some assistance. Uh, but about 3.7 shows per property per week. So if your listing has gone stale and you're not getting three or four showings per property per week on these listings, it may be time to consider a price reduction. Uh, conversely, we were looking at about 13 and a half to 14 shows to go under contract. So if you've had 13 or 14 showings and no offers, that may be signal number two that you need to make a price reduction. Signal number three, we're holding in fast this week, again, at about eight median days on market. So if you've been on the market for longer than eight days and you haven't met that following criteria, maybe time to consider a price reduction. Um, I was looking at this information for Parker in the over million dollar segment yesterday, and the data points were totally different looking out into Parker. That market is a little bit slower because there is new construction competing with residential resale and at a higher price point, there are fewer buyers that are out there. And so I looked at that data for Parker and it was 12 median days on market for the over million dollar segment. Uh, it was uh, three shows per property per week. Uh, and it was about 16 showings to go under contract. So that market was running a little bit slower when I looked out at the Parker neighborhoods. 
Plus, uh, the rate of price decreases for units that went under contract last week also declined. So we only saw that 25.7% of the units that went under contract last week made a price change, with 71.7% making no change to their price whatsoever. Uh, we also saw that the price decreases went down. It was only about a 4.8% price reduction, or about $32,500 off of uh, a home based off of data from last week for those units that did go under contract. The reason why this data is so important is if you're looking at monthly data for February and the reports that come out and are published monthly, is that our market is significantly shifted going into the end of February, beginning of March, and even just this last week. And so if you're looking at data from the closed transactions in February, that's a function of what went under contract in January which was likely listed in November and December. And so that data has aged about 90 days and it's not going to give you a good sense of what you need to do in order to look at these reports and make decisions for your transactions. Looking at this, this is based off of pending transactions. And so this is truly what's happening in the market based off of data from last week. So it is super important that you guys start looking at this information and perhaps sharing it with your clients. But it is unique from those monthly reports that are published, uh, various ones throughout Metro Denver. The under $500,000 market, again, we have a slightly extended selling season where May is still a really great time to list, but it does have more inventory in there. So there's more competition on the listing side turning some of these cells blue as our inventory starts to get pumped up. Uh, strategy sheet break, built out on a weekly basis. Again, everything's looking really nice and warming up across the board. Things did cool ever so slightly, as you can see some of those yellow cells start to pop in there as we got into spring break for some of our different school districts. Our average daily active count in this market went down by 4% uh, based off of data from last week. New listings were down by 6.2% and pending transactions were down 14%. Uh, for transactions on this last week. Back on markets were also down by about 25.4%, but overall our predicted month supply of inventory is sitting at 0 0.5 months worth of inventory signaling multiple offers are highly likely. The odds of selling declined week over week by just under 1%, sitting at 74.4%, which is a really great odds of selling for this particular price range. Not quite as hot as what we saw in 21 or 22, but it still is on pace with what we saw back in 20. 2020s, with the exception of the pandemic. Uh, in this market, we would need to have about 9,800 total homes available for sale, whereas we only have 855 total listings available for sale. So we only have 8.7% of a balanced market right now. We're looking at about six shows per property per week in the under $500,000 market and about 13 showings to go under contract right now. So if you've had a total of 13 showings and no offers, it may be time to consider a price reduction. We're looking at median days on market Market sitting at six that declined by two days going into this last week so sales really sped up uh, as we got into this under five hundred thousand dollar market 27.2 percent of what went under contract last week made a price reduction with 70 percent remaining unchanged Average price reduction was uh, up, uh, I'm sorry, it was down by 1.2% this last week. It was about a 4.5% price reduction or about $18,000 off of the original price to get it under contract. 500 to a million, I was really hopeful to see more uh, market activity in this particular segment. This is our most interest rate sensitive segment that we, that we deal with where 90% of the borrowers that are purchasing in this market require some sort of financing. And they had a nice boost of affordability this last week with interest rates being down half a percent, I was hopeful that more people would take advantage of this particular market. We did see a little bit of a cooling trend in this market as well. Our average daily active count went up by 2.1% pendings were uh, flat at 558 total units going under contract this last week. So I was hoping to see that number go up a little bit. Back on markets, we're also down by about 14.2%. So we're seeing transactions really stick through right now. New listings this week were down by about 9.4% with 552 listings hitting the market. Our predicted month supply of inventory went up by about 2.1%. We were sitting at 0 0.9 months worth of inventory. So this is where I'm talking about. It's really spot body depending on which neighborhood you're in, if you're going to be in multiple offers or not. 
Uh, the odds of selling increased this week by about 0.7%. It was about 63.8% chance of selling uh, for the next week. This has come down from a couple weeks ago where we peaked up to 65.5% about two to three weeks ago, uh, but it's still overall a very good number. And I'm thrilled to see that number going into spring, even in a higher interest rate in, uh, environment. In this market, we only have 2,000 total homes available for sale. To offset demand, we'd need to be closer to that 14,500 mark. So we're sitting at about 14.4% of a balanced market right now. We're looking at about 3.5 shows per property per week. Uh, so if you're not getting your three and a half showings per property per week, that may be sign number one that you need to make a price reduction. Conversely, we're looking at 13 showings to go under contract. So if you've had a total of 13 showings and no offers, maybe sign number two that you need to make a price reduction. In this last week, we were looking at nine median days on market. So went up by one based off of data from the last couple of weeks for those pending transactions. Price reductions went down by about 5.1% this last week, where we only saw that 26% ended up making price reductions with 71.6% making no change whatsoever. The average price reduction also went down 4.7% off of the original price, or about $34,000, $34,500 of a price reduction right now. Once we go into the over million dollar segment, the size of the inventory that I'm looking at really declines. I'm only looking at 7.6% of our overall inventory once we go over a million dollars for one to 1.5 million. Uh, your best time frame to list, March and April, you can see that the cooling trend really starts to settle in as we get more inventory on the market headed into uh, the beginning of May. Uh, in this market, uh, this market ended up showing signs of cooling as we ended up going into our spring break week. These folks are more likely to fly out of town during spring break week because they have the money to do so. So we end up seeing this market cool a little bit more over spring break week. Uh, our average daily active count actually went down in this market by about 4.2%. New listing activity was down by 2.4% and our pending transactions were down by 20% in this market week over week. Uh, we were looking at a predicted month supply of inventory at 1.2 months worth of inventory, which is up from the one month of inventory that we saw last week. Douglas County is one of our more expensive counties in Metro Denver, so this market could have been really impacted by having Douglas County on spring break last week. We saw the odds of selling decrease week over week by about 4.2% or about 53.3% odds of selling. Uh, we're looking at about 13% of balance in this particular market. We would need to have about 2,600 total available homes for sale in this market to offset demand right now. We're looking at about 2.4 shows per property per week. Shows per listing fell by about 19.1% from week over week. Uh, we had 826 total showings that were set. Spring break week took about 22.5% of the showings out of the market over this last week. We're looking at about 12 showings to go under contract right now. So if you've had a total of 12 showings and no offers, it may be time to consider a price reduction. We're looking at about six median days on market. So we had a bunch of people out there looking and they were putting the new stuff under contract. Median days on market Market. It was at its second lowest for this week. A couple weeks ago, we hit five median days on market. We're looking at about six median days on market for what went under contract last week. Uh, we only saw 18.5% of what went under contract last week make a price reduction. 80% remained unchanged in their original list price. Uh, we were looking at a uh, price reduction of about 6.5% or about $94,500 off of the original price to get it under contract. Last price point that I can measure on a weekly basis, 1.5 to 2 million at 2.8 of the overall market. Uh, your perfect time frame in which to list is typically March for this market. In April, we really start to notice that this market cools down with more inventory coming to market as we get into April. This last week, we really saw a cooling pattern set in for the $1.5 to $2 million mark where a lot of sales turned yellow. Uh, the previous couple of weeks, uh, the last week of February and the first week of March, 
were our hottest weeks so far in terms of our market activity. Inventory has really started to pick up in this market. You can see here, this is my active trend line. Our active inventory is sitting at 174 average daily active units. We're sitting at 10.8% up week over week, even though new listing activity fell by about 33.3% week over week. What was interesting to see is week over week, our pending transactions picked up by 5.6%. There were 19 transactions that went under contract. Our overall month supply of inventory was sitting at about 2.1 months worth of inventory, which is up from where we were the last week of February and the first week of March at one, point, at one month worth of inventory. So again, our market has softened just a little bit. For every one buyer in this market, they have approximately two homes to choose from. Um, uh, we peaked out a couple of weeks ago at the end of February and the beginning of March with a 57.6% odds of selling. We're now down to about a 44.2% odds of selling. So I hope that after spring break, this starts to rebound as we get into April. Uh, we're sitting at about 17.5% of a balanced market. We would need to have just shy of 1,000 units available for sale in order to offset demand in this particular market. We're looking at about two shows per property per week, uh, and it was about 17 17.8 showings to go under contract. So again, there were a lot of people that were out there looking, but they weren't putting stuff under contract. They're waiting for that new inventory to make its way to market. Median days on market for those units that did go under contract was about 10. Uh, we saw 11.8% of what went under contract last week made a price reduction, with 82.4% of them making no price reduction whatsoever. The average price reduction was 9.2% or about $200,000 off of the original asking price. Now, again, I wanted to go through and share with you really quick uh, where we're hot and where we're not throughout Metro Denver. So I have a different report that I'm gonna pop up for you guys. So that you can see the overall heat map broken out by price uh, by zip code so that you can see where our market picks up. And this is in the monthly report. And so here's our month supply of inventory. And this is for February. And so again, this is based off of closed data. So this data has aged slightly, but the areas that are hot are still hot. Those that are in blue are not, okay? So in February, we had about 1.45 overall months worth of inventory. We were hot in areas that turned red and orange where we have less than one month worth of inventory signaling multiple offers. So you can see that these inner landlocked ring suburbs on the southeast side of town, the south side of town, south and west side of town and northwest side of town and a little bit up here in Thornton and North Glen, we're all below one month worth of inventory signaling. This is where we're most likely to see these multiple offers coming out. Lakewood specifically was very hot getting into some of these different areas. Our hottest zone was actually Central Park where we had 0 0.37 months worth of inventory where at the current rate of sales, we'd sell out of the existing inventory in approximately 10 days. Areas that ended up cooling off, conifer and pine with 2.24 months worth of inventory. Getting down into Sterling Ranch, just to the west of Chatfield Reservoir, uh, 2.94 months worth of inventory. Uh, here into Wash Park, we were actually sitting at 2.6 months worth of inventory. And a little bit of green as we get into some of these central Denver neighborhoods, uh, getting into um, like Cole and Whittier. Uh, we ended up seeing cooling patterns as we got into Lodo. Lodo was sitting at about 4.7 months worth of inventory, so we're not likely to see multiple offers coming out in the Lodo market. Also, fewer multiple offers, and uh, we're seeing more concessions and more new construction make its way to market. As you get out here south of the airport, we're sitting about 4.8 months worth of inventory, and then down into Elbert County, we're at 4.53 months worth of inventory. So it depends on where you are in Metro Denver for how those homes are going to sell. It really shifts and changes pretty drastically throughout the city, so it's important that you're paying attention to this by the zip code. Can you guys hear my cat meowing? I had a lot of Facebook requests that people wanted to come out and they want to see Bob. So Bob is now in my office and I'll see if he'll pop up on my lap for you. Uh, but he usually, he stopped sitting in my lap and he has stopped snuggling with me, which I'm really upset about because he's gotten real comfortable in my house. Uh, but maybe Bob will make an appearance towards the end if I can wrangle him in here. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of questions that popped up here. So we'll go ahead and do these. Uh, do the pending numbers indicate the total number of homes that change their status from active to pending? Or does it just detail all pending listings? Uh, 
in their time frame, regardless of when they gain their pending status. So what I look for when I'm doing the pending status is those that had a contract date of the last week. So I'm actually tracking when it went under contract. So it's shifting from an active status to a pending status is what I'm tracking. Uh, it said 50% of showings are in Broker Bay. How does that impact your overall numbers? Lauren, it's actually 10% of all the showings are set through Broker Bay. So there's a variance of about 10% right now as I go through and pull those numbers. So you could probably add one showing a week to there. Broker Bay is really challenging to try and extract data from. And so I am working on that. I've provided feedback to the MLS and hopefully they'll take that to heed so that when we transition over to Broker Bay completely and still able to track all of the showing data for Broker Bay. Uh, so can I explain the odds of selling stat? Yes, that's basically where I take into account all of the available listings for sale versus those that go under contract and or close in the same week. And I project it forward for a 4.35 week period of time. So that projects the odds of selling based off of data from that week for the next 30 day period. Uh, do I have a zip code heat map? That was the heat map that I was showing you. I have about eight different heat maps that are for each zip code, but I don't have the strategy sheets by zip code. It is simply too much work and too many rows of data for me to try and maintain, uh, but it's roughly the same all over Metro Denver for when the best time to sell ads. Uh, so how is Skyland faring? Let's go ahead and pop up that report really quick. And that was uh, 80205. In the back of the attached and the detached reports that I'm going to send to you guys in a little bit, uh, I can go through and pull this out. And there's a zip code index in the very back of the report for you. So in Skyland, we have about a $587,000 average sales price. We're looking at about 34 average days on market. That number has gone down. This is based off of closings from February. We're at 16.3% of balance, 1.34 months worth of inventory, a 61.8% odds of selling, 98.6% close to list price ratio, 53.1% for closings in February were under contract in seven days or less. 31.3% ended up reducing their price. The average price reduction was big with a 10% price reductions. 43.8% sold for over asking price at about 2.6%. So there is your overall market share for or market report for 80205. Hearing a lot more appraisal issues. What are you seeing? Comment. Important to list price listing accurate as possible using your weekly reports. So Nicole, let's talk about appraisals. What are you seeing out there? Because you're seeing that probably a lot more than I am. We, yeah, we have not had a lot of low appraisals. So I was kind of expecting that based on the comparison data uh, in the, the competitiveness having been spiked because we're seeing offers coming in 25, 50, 100,000 over asking. But we're really not seeing a lot of low appraisals, a few in some very specific areas. We're getting a lot of appraisal waivers. So that's been a huge blessing that we've been able to take advantage of. And we're even offering to check to see if we have an appraisal waiver before you go under contract. Awesome. I'm trying to go through and answer some of these other questions. There were some other questions about different neighborhoods and how those are performing. I'm going to send you all of these reports at about 1145 this morning. So you can go to the attached or the detached residential report and you can flip to the back for your zip code index so you guys can check out what's happening in your neighborhoods. Uh, there will be a report that goes out for attached dwellings also today so that you can see how that report uh, performed for February. There's not a huge difference between the attached and the detached markets right now, except for in super luxury price points. And those super luxury price points often fall in the Lodo market uh, for those attached dwellings that are kind of bearing a little bit more slowly right now. Uh, I'm new to the webinar. Can I get on your list for info and future webinars? This is great. Yes, since you have signed up for this webinar, you are now on my email list until one of us dies. And so you will get a copy of this. Uh, I go through and I pull the update and I'll be sending out a copy of all of the reports for you uh, a little bit later today. Uh, and so let's see. Uh, wow, Broker Bay PR pushing the adoption rate only 10%. Good to know. Yes, yeah, so it is only 10%. Uh, get an appraisal waiver if you can. I just got completely screwed on an appraisal in Wash Park. Oh no, that's really unfortunate. I'm so sorry to hear about that, Heidi. Uh, do you see appraisers using comps from last summer or not? Uh, what do you see, Nicole? That's it's just too far back. Um, I know as real estate agents, we talk a lot about, and Megan talks a lot about using uh, numbers from last spring or even last January. 
but an appraiser is going to have a hard time justifying going that far back. So they're going to have to use some of the values that are lower. And especially, you know, when you're talking about Wash Park, Megan, if you highlighted, which is really interesting and surprising to me, that Wash Park was seeing an uptick in inventory, which is causing that little bit of a supply and demand um, offset compared to some of the other markets. Well, that could impact, obviously, the appraisals because they're using the ones that have recently sold in that neighborhood. Absolutely. You cannot get an appraisal waiver on a Govy or a Jumbo loan, but every conventional offer that you're putting in, you should check to see if you can get an appraisal waiver. It all has to do with the home currently. So it has... It has something to do with the buyer because they have to meet the specific um, as far as the amount down and they're, how they're buying it. But it also is the home. Does it currently have a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan on it? And if it does, and you've got a, a buyer that's coming in that meets the guidelines required for having an appraisal waiver, then those two match. If you've got a buyer that had an FHA loan on it for the last 10 years, you're not going to get an appraisal waiver, which is why we always check Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac not just one or the other, because one could have it in the database and the other one wouldn't. Awesome. Well, I went five minutes over. I'm so sorry. We had a lot of good questions today. And so I'm so sorry that I couldn't answer all of your questions about how your market area is performing. Again, in the attached and the detached residential reports that I'll be sending out today, you can flip to the back of the report and there's a zip code index in there for you. So I'll turn it over to Nicole. So take it away. Fantastic. You know, and there's so many lending questions right now as far as, you know, it's it's the whipsaw of interest rates, which we can't get ourselves caught up in. Certainly when interest rates drop and it gives us that plug of affordability into that weekend, you want to know about it. And you want to communicate that with your active buyers who are out looking that says that this might be the weekend that we can actually tip up and over what we might have been limited to the weekend before. So definitely you want to be aware of where the interest rates are going, but the whipsaw can whipsaw your clients too. So you don't want to do that. You just want to stay relevant uh, in the conversation. You want to absolutely be bringing value uh, each week or each month or how often that you trip on your database. But those who are active, you want to communicate what's happening. And then these weekly calls are so instrumental I mean, Megan and I joke about the fact that we had hoped to go on a monthly basis at some point, and we even started doing that in the middle, but it just is so much information. And especially, Megan, as you were pointing out, the, the monthly data can get aged very quickly. And it's interesting, one of the reports that I'll show you, we were talking about the um, on new home sales, the median price whether it's going down or up right now, it's going down. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of commentary right now going, well, but really look at the appreciation levels, which I agree with. Appreciation is the real value change. But the problem with appreciation is CoreLogic, Freddie Mac, those big databases that do appreciation on any kind of level are usually two months behind us. And now you're talking about homes that were under contract three months ago, three and a half months ago. So the market is changing so fast. The weekly data, whether it's updates on the Fed or the economy or interest rates, but more even importantly, what's happening with days on market or what's happening with showings and what's happening with that opportunity uh, that Megan talks about all the time is so critical. So let's, I'm gonna jump into our slide deck and start talking a little bit about the Fed met this week. That was on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh my gosh, it's so funny you were talking about Bob. In my background, I've got thumping going on because <laughs> I'm in a resort in Mexico. And so I can hear it. I hope you guys can't. I don't think you can. Okay. <laughs> You're like, I'm worried about Bob. I'm worried about the radio, out the band that's happening. Um, all right. So as we kind of go through, um, let's talk a little bit about what just happened. So Powell is probably the conversation. Whoops. Um, Powell is, uh, is very much the conversation. So we knew we really had two options. He was either going to hold and not do any Fed rate raise, or he was going to raise it a quarter. The 50 bips was off the table, and he raised it a quarter. And honestly, I don't think he had a choice. A couple of people had asked me, what did I think? And I was like, I don't, I don't know that he can't raise it a quarter because we have not contained inflation, yet we had bank failures. So he can't keep pushing 
further and he kind of really scrapped the whole higher for longer and faster conversation that wasn't in this meeting at all so really what he was highlighting is the fact that inflation does remain elevated the employment unemployment rate is still remaining low so recent indicators po uh, pointing to modest growth meaning it's not as accelerated we don't have this like joyous economy at the moment. We just have a trucking economy that's doing well. We know that jobless claims are still actually, in fact, I've got a, uh, the report showing that they actually take down. Retail sales is still good. People are spending on services instead of on goods. We're actually seeing manufacturing is going into recessionary period yet. Do we care? I mean, United States is really a service oriented country. So when you you package all of this up to go, how is the economy? And I'd say the economy is it's okay, really. A lot of industries aren't impacted by what's happening. The banking industry, obviously, the real estate industry, yes, we've been dealing with it. The IT industry, yes. Durable good sales, probably, although car sales continues to surprise me. But you know, you might not see as many people buying washers and dryers and other durable goods, but they're spending money. They're traveling. They're going to hotels. They're going to Cancun. They're doing the things, right? Because not all industries are being impacted the same. And he talked about that. The, the jobs and the wages are still up, although they're up slower. So all of this to say the economy is still good. Like we have to just continue to go out there and be the positive beacons where we're talking to our clients that when their life is ready to buy or sell, that we're here to support them, that we're not wrapped up in what the media is saying, but because they're getting married or divorced or having children or pregnant, whether they got a job or they had to move for, to take a different job, those life events are still happening. And then capitalizing on knowing the specific micro markets is really the power behind what we can do when we come to support them. Hey, I've got a little bit of this information that talks about where the markets overall is in the strength of the economy, which is going to impact what we expect interest rates to do, which is going to impact your affordability, maybe the offers that we can put in this weekend. And here's some of the markets that if we go into this market, we're probably gonna have a multiple bid situation. We're gonna have to have over asking. This market, we're not. So maybe a similar home in a different market might be the best resource especially if you're talking to a first time home buyer that's looking to use FHA or VA or down payment assistance. We're still doing a ton of those. In fact, we have several under contract right now using the MMA social equity program, which I love that program. And as a reminder, if you don't know about it, that's the 15,000 or 25,000 grant that you're given if you have either you or one of your relatives lived in one of the red line areas. And some of those neighborhoods would absolutely surprise you that today they're not minority neighborhoods, or maybe today they're not even low income neighborhoods, but they had been in the past because demographics have changed. So absolutely, if you're talking to a buyer who's looking for opportunities for first time home buyer uh, grants, down payment assistance, you should be checking the red line map with MMA and the social equity program. So back to Powell. Powell's also talking and he's kind of banking on the fact he's like, oh crap, you know, we just saw these five banks, not just one, not just two, five banks that are having issues collapsing, being taken over by the FDIC, being bought out. And yet the banking industry is resilient. We talked about that. I talked about that on the live earlier this week about Holy smoke, like we just bounced back from that. You don't have five banks go into issues like we just saw, and yet the economy just like kind of ignored it for all, all intents and purposes. We had a blip with the 10 year, we had some rate volatility based on the fear and this flight to safety of people leaving stocks and going over to bonds. And then the more that we forgot about it just having happened days or a week ago, the market started to rebalance and people started to put their money back into stock. So you have this money that's not being taken out of the bank depositories and put under your mattress, but simply being moved from one bank that seems a little less secure to a bank that seems more secure. And you might even have more deposits at the larger banks. So we might see some sort of movement from either the local banks, the smaller banks, the mid-sized banks to the larger banks. So it is going to change some competitiveness. But what he's saying. And it's actually going to also change 
credit conditions. So the recent developments are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, and it's going to weigh on the economic activity, on hiring, and on inflation. So he's banking on the fact that the fact that the banks, which were because of the Fed, like let's not let's not remove him from this whole chain of events, right? But he's saying, well, you know, it happened. I'd like to say that he could have seen it coming a little bit, but this has happened and this is going to impact and do some of the work for us. So we don't have to raise higher and faster for longer because the bank collapse might do some of the work on tamp uh, tamping down inflation. And if that's the case, it's a little bit of a wait and see. So he's kind of looking at this going, all right, we're going to raise it a quarter. I have to let the markets know inflation's still an issue, but I'm not necessarily anxious to do anything because I do see the banks are failing and I do see the bank failure is impacting the economy and tightening guidelines. Now we had already had 11 of the last 12 months where credit was already tightening. So those credit requirements were starting to tighten up. And now on top of that, you have these banks who can't lend as quickly because you do have some of those people who have pulled out their deposits. So with less deposits, they can lend less. So some banks are actually pulling back on what they can lend. Other banks, you're going to see some opportunities, but they're going to get a little swifter, a little tighter in how they do that. So you would expect to see some of those bank regulations. Now, remember, I talked about this last week. Fannie and Freddie are not market-driven. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government-backed. So just like FHA and VA and USDA, Fannie and Freddie are not going to have credit tightening specific to this market shift. They're going to have credit tightening based on their desire to support the lower income or help those who have been disadvantaged in getting into housing get into housing, yet, and which is absolutely impacting our, our higher net worth or our higher buyers, our second home buyers, our investment buyers, our um, high cost buyers. We're seeing all those interest rates being impacted by this social move towards housing equality, different completely from what's happening in this credit environment, which is going to impact the banks. So again, really, why do you need to know this as a real estate agent? Well, you might have conversations with your clients where they say, well, I was pre-approved by the bank, but now the bank is sh shifting their guidelines and I'm no longer approved or I'm approved for less or my, my um, loan options have shifted where I'm not really pleased with this loan option. So they're either looking for another lender or maybe they'll just step out of the housing market altogether. So being armed with this to go, I, I did hear about that. And I do know the banks are tightening up, but I do know that we have some other options. I should have you talk to my lender, AKA Nicole Ruth, right? So those are the opportunities to be in front of this conversation instead of surprised by it when they come back to you after they've talked to their lender or their bank. So they did increase the Fed rate as we talked about by the quarter, but he also said that the increases are near the end. So that, of course, was celebrated by the markets, as you can imagine. So we want to see the end of this. Now, he didn't necessarily say that we're going to be cutting rates. So they also published their dot plot. And as you can see right here, the majority of people are saying that it's going to sit right there at 5.1, that we're really kind of looking at that. And then over the next couple of years, this is 2023 right here, and this is 2024, and this is 2025, and then this is the longer run. So we're expecting it to drop down but we're expecting this year to stay flat. He's saying we are not baking in rate cuts. What he didn't say is that we weren't gonna do rate cuts. So let's be very clear on what he said. He said, we're not baking in, the rate cuts are not in our base case. So he's watching, he's open to it. You gotta believe that the market's like this. In fact, the market completely disagreed with the fact that we were gonna keep rates flush for the rest of the year. They say that we're going to start dropping rates as quickly as July, and then we're going to see an entire 1% rate drop in the Fed rate. And to Megan's point, there's no guarantee. And in fact, something very similar to this just happened in January, if you remember, when our rates dropped down and everybody started talking about rates in the fives, and then the unemployment number in the job uh, reports was released the very beginning of February, and we all remember vividly what just happened in February, where the interest rates popped back up to seven and a quarter. This is not written in stone, and it's not even an absolute or even close, but the markets believe that we're going to see a point, and so they're already talking about this happening, 
which is causing our 10 year to drop some, which is giving us some relief in our interest rates. Again, you can't be the town crier and talk about interest rates every time they go up or go down. Can you arm yourself with that data when the active buyers are asking you what they can afford saying, hey, I just heard that interest rates dropped a quarter, an eighth, a half. We should talk to your lender, AKA Nicole Ruth, and we should get you qualified for what that number is or get a second opinion if you wanna be qualified for more. But this is something that, to Megan's point, we have seasonality. And I love our seasonality because it allows us to plan. And I'm a planner and I like my numbers. But I also know too that I'm seeing investment opportunities and I'm seeing investors getting busy. So they're looking at this opportunity. And it's even more reason to talk to your current buyers that if we see interest rates drop in the second half of the year and we don't see enough inventory pickup. We could see just enough demand. It could still stay within seasonal trend lines, but we could see just enough demand picking up on limited inventory with dropped rates, which is going to cause prices to push. So getting in sooner is going to be your best bet and then taking advantage of when those rates drops just to do a refinance. Again, making sure that your numbers fit in your side your budget right now. I'm not a gambler. I need to make sure I never buy something on the promise that it cash flows later or that my payment gets better later, but I will hopefully, hopefully hope for it, if not plan for it. So we saw that not only did the Fed do it, but then all the other banks swept around. The ECB raised their rates by 0.5 last week, right before the Fed. And then right after the Fed did theirs, the Bank of England did theirs, Hong Kong did theirs, Switzerland raised theirs. This is a worldwide attack on inflation. I bring this up because as you can imagine, we're a very global economy right now. And as all markets are attacking inflation, that is better than just one country or several countries doing it as we're trying to slow down the spending and increase supply, reduce demand, and put um, the, the interest rates back in line. Initial jobless claims though, continues to be strong. Really, I just don't know what he's going to have to do to actually tumble unemplo uh, unemployment and jobless claims. We're still seeing that. Of course, we'll see the unemployment numbers coming out right before Easter as well. Um, so all of those numbers, in fact, March, I think March 31st is a Friday, right? So we'll actually see the job numbers um, and unemployment coming out. Um, I guess that would be good Friday. So as we see those numbers coming out, we're gonna, it's going to be kind of that cue as to what happens in April, because I'm getting this weird feeling of what we had in, in January, right before February's numbers. So if April really does surprise us, we could see the markets rubber band back to higher interest rates. If we see that the job numbers come in a little softer, if we see unemployment maybe even tick up a little bit, that could be a good sign. Of course, the PCE numbers, inflation numbers come out on March 31st. And then we'll have CPI again at the beginning of April. All of those things we're going to watch, are, are they um, collaborating with this kind of, yes, the market is slowly slowing down, but nothing dramatic. So we did see the Fed meeting had the impact. So the 10-year actually popped up substantially after all of the, the heightened fear around this, like the flight to safety for the bonds with the banks. Then we actually saw going into the Fed meeting, this, oh no, what's gonna happen? What is he gonna say? We actually saw the 10 year spike up just a hair and then we saw it dropping down. Somebody even texted me, they go, did the Fed, did the rates drop twice? I'm like, well, the 10 year dropped significantly twice during the same day. So that's in the same day. So that's all the movement after the meeting minutes and after Powell's speech. So we saw that the rates did drop. They picked up overnight a little bit and then they're starting to ease back down. We're definitely seeing the 10 year is moving in our favor. And really it's just heading back to where it was during January. But interestingly enough, even though we're heading back towards January, and again, let's watch that February uh, third job data. As we do head back towards January, what we aren't really seeing is the interest rates as low as they were in January, because they were touching the bottom of 6%. A lot of these interest rates do include points to buy down the interest rates. But of course, we were seeing people talking about rates in the high to mid fives getting out there. So now they're just, they're hovering up here with the same 10 year as we saw the mortgage rates at six. So we're about a half a point spread. You're like, why? That all has to do with the risk factor in the mortgage market. 
right? So you have the 10 year and the 30 year fixed, the 10 year treasury yield and the 30 year fixed mortgage rate. They're, they're like, they're not twins, right? They're close cousins and they're moving together. Or maybe they're brother and sister. They're, the Fed rate might be more like close cousins. Anyway, they're moving together. Start rambling in my brain. They're moving together, but they spread that difference between the 10 year treasury and the 30 year fixed has a lot to do with the risk associated in the financial markets. And as you can imagine, we're just a couple of weeks off from having five banks um, on the verge of collapsing that the financial markets are feeling a little risk. So you would expect that to be a little bit more wider spread than we saw back in January. So we'll continue to watch that. And especially as we get those financial markets stabilized, we could see some more drops in the 30-year fixed mortgage rates, really without even more movement from the 10-year treasury yield. Mortgage purchase applications popped up 2%, not a lot, but after the last two weeks, it popped up 7%. And I know what Megan was saying is we weren't seeing the pendings uh, rise up, and maybe that's because the right houses weren't on the market and people were off for spring break. But the demand is still there. People are still active. Plus, you had all the demand that came in in January and February that didn't really do anything. So the demand, I mean, we had some really good demand applications in January that all those people didn't get under contract. Their applications are still out there. There's just the new applications were up to, uh, 2% this last week. So that's good news for me. We're still staying active. We're staying in communication with our clients. New construction came out. So we're actually seeing negative numbers year over year, positive numbers month over month. Interestingly enough, a big portion of those numbers were multifamily. So those single family starts are still not keeping up. Permits were up 7%, but which is still less than what they were. They were up 14%, double that for overall market, but a much smaller percent, uh, percent sorry, was for single family. So single family is still going to lag. It's really not going to be the savior that we need for our inventory. It's going to do a little bit of a, of a um, push, but not certainly enough, especially when you see the single family homes for rent being built more than the single family homes for purchase. New home sales were up 1.1, which led to builders feeling more confident. So it jumped up a little bit over the last three reports from 31 to 44. So that's a good sign. So even though the builders are feeling a little risk with the financial markets. They're feeling like they've got an edge with the inventory. And they even say that as builders continue to deal with stubbornly high construction costs and material supply chain disruptions, they continue to report strong pent up demand. As buyers are waiting for interest rates to drop, turning more to the new home market due to the existing home market inventory shortage. So those builders are still feeling good. So as a real estate agent, you definitely should be reaching out to those new builders, seeing what inventory they do co have coming online so that you can support your current buyers in the pipeline. I don't love that, but do know that we always will match or at least try to match. I will do my very best effort. If there's something that the builder's doing, like they're doing the entire basement, they're finishing off the landscaping, or they're giving some sort of a rate buy down down to the mid fours, there might be places I can't go. But if a builder's only giving like a 1% or 1.5% or less than that builder credit or incentive for using their builder lender, I can't tell you on the daily how many times I hear from realtors going, I wish they could have closed with you. That builder incentive wasn't worth it. It's either falling apart now, it's super stressful, we're delaying closing, whatever that is. The builder's lenders just don't, they're, they have a captive audience, so they're just not sharpening their saw like the rest of us right now. February existing home sales came out talking about the inventory. Investors were actually up. So there you go. They went from, oh, I'm sorry. No, investors were flat. So they went from, uh, they're at 28% of the market from 29. Locally, we're actually talking to a lot more investors and we're doing a lot more investor classes. So that's something that you guys want to definitely talk to me about. Uh, home sales spiked a little bit in February. It's still down. They talked about the median price drop, but month over month, we're still strong. So really quickly, as we have a couple minutes left, we've got three renovation loans going right now, this month closing. If you've got first-time home buyers, you need to be talking about the 3% down renovation loans. We also have 10% down ITIN loans, and we're ramping up a new Spanish loan application. Super excited about that. That's brand new. And then our building and investment empire this month is going to be on Zoom. So not only are we going to do April's Building Investment Empire on Zoom, so if you have clients that are out of town that have been wanting to come, make sure they know about that. 
but we also are doing a lot of empire classes with individual agents or teams or brokerages because the conversation is turning to how do I look forward to my financial stability and future using real estate? Awesome. You've got a couple of questions that popped up here that I want to make sure that we get through before we end our webinar today. Uh, so Frankie asked on VA loans, should you use current comps for the appraisal? For the appraisal, you'll absolutely have to because that's what they're going to be using. Of course, remember the VA is the only appraiser that is actually managed by the VA. Everybody else we manage with our appraisal management company, um, but the VA does control there. So they're going to be a little bit more restrictive on that. Awesome. Uh, just a comment from Clark. I've seen investors get a lot more active in the past month. Um, I definitely have some flippers that I'm starting to work with. Uh, and so some of that activity is definitely picking up. And Nicole, do you have some investors that you're, are you seeing more people attend your class? We are seeing a lot more. The, our investment classes are full almost every month now. And not only that, but we're doing a lot of these, as I mentioned, these one-offs. So if you want to do an investment class with your team to that team's sphere, whether it's you get the whole team together and you do a sphere and you do an evening event, or if it's a smaller group and you just do a, a table or a more intimate setting, and I'll come in and have those conversations, whether it's a slide deck for a bigger group or just a sit down conversation for a smaller group. I want to educate as many people as I can. This is that whole pay it forward, guys. We've got to make sure that we're educating, staying relevant and helping our clients. Because when we become that, that real estate agent, that, that lender, now we're advisors. We're much more than transactional. So uh, reach out so, to me for sure. Sorry. Yeah. And so they want to know how to sign up for the building an empire zoom class. We will be sending that out uh, via email. So if you're on our email list, make sure to check your spam if you don't get it and we'll have it on our website as well. Yeah. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I'm glad that you do the ITIN loans. I had an agent offering 3.5 uh, on an FHA for ITIN and it's making it very confusing because ID verification on a government loan. Uh, and then quick question, confused by some of the slides showing rates. I believe you showed projections that the Fed rate and then also the 30 year fixed. Is that correct? So yes, so the dot plot is all about uh, the projections for where they believe the Fed rate is going to go. Remember, the Fed rate is, is being raised in order to fight inflation. Once inflation is under control, we're going to see the 30-year fixed. So we did show several graphs for the Fed rate, the 10-year, which is more based on the Fed rate, and then the 30-year fixed, which follows the 10-year. And I'm happy to jump on a phone call and kind of walk through those in the relationship so that you know how to read what the market is saying or CNBC or the news cycle so that you can communicate what that's going to do to rates. Awesome. Thank you so much. That takes us through all of our questions. We'll go ahead and sign off for the rest of the week. Let Nicole get out to her party in Cancun, Mexico. Uh, I got to get all the webinar reports out to you guys. And so I'll be doing that as soon as I get a copy of the recording. I'll be sending out a copy of the recording today, along with all of the reports that we've talked about. And so please feel free to peruse those. And if you have any questions, always reach out to Nicole Ruth or myself, Megan Aller with First American Title. And we're always happy to help you out. Uh, we will be back at it next week. And then we will publish all of the dates for April. Please keep in mind, I will be on vacation April 9th. So we will not have a webinar on that day. So we'll be skipping one day in April. Nicole's probably going to go live. She always goes live when I can't make it. And I always like, no, I'll just take the week off. It's okay. That means I don't have to get up at four. Only the big news happens. Day. I don't know. Nice. Nice. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And we certainly hope that you will keep us in mind for your future transactions. So please reach out to us. Uh, and we hope to see you at our closing table soon. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.